Hello. With the holiday season upon us, I wanted to do a little video on pastry molds. But before we get started, make sure to select like if you like this video, click subscribe, and that way you can be updated when new videos come out. And if you happen to have any questions, please feel free and post your questions or comments below. Now, on to today's discussion. Welcome to today's discussion. As you can see, the topic of today is Gebäck Model. That is German for pastry mold or pattern model. Gebäck is pastry and model, model is the mold. A quick history on pastry molds. Simple molds were used as early as 3000 BC. Molds were used in Mesopotamia, Egypt, Greece, and then later during the Roman Empire. These molds could have been made out of pottery, wood, or metal castings. The first mention of Lebkuchen is in 1296 in Ulm. Gingerbread was first mentioned in 1335, and later a guild was formed about 1415. By 1419, Prague already had 18 gingerbread make bakers. Around 1420, the first recipe for, if I mispronounced this, I am sorry, I do not do French well, pain de, de pis, okay. please correct me on that, was invented in, it looks like rhyme, reams, rhymes, but I know it's French, so I'm going to say re. It's a city in the Alsace Champagne Lorraine region. In 1487, Emperor Frederick III of the Holy Roman Empire tried to improve his public approval rating by having 4,000 gingerbread cookies baked with his image on the cookies and then to give them to local children. Don't know if that worked, but you will find that with pastry molds through history, that royalty loved using this as a propaganda piece. In 1596, Henry IV of France officially recognized the corporate statues from 1571 of 20 gingerbread masters. The woodcarver guild blossomed during the 16th and 17th centuries, allowing for more molds to be made. During the 17th century, Springerlet boards traveled with immigrating women to America. And Springerle cookies reached the height of their popularity in the 18th century. Now I'm sure you've already noticed, I've, I've put out a few words there that you may or may not recognize. Gingerbread, you probably recognize. But do you recognize Springerle or Leibkuchen? Let's look more into that. Springerle is German. However, here, um, here in the United States, I've actually heard these cookies referred to as Springerly or Springly, and that's Springly is completely omitting that er in the middle of the word Springly. So it's definitely the Americanized version of this German word. In German, the s would make like an SCH sound in English. So it's sh, spring, uh, cookies. Springerle cookies date back to the 17th century in Southern Germany, parts of Switzerland, and also it was seen in the Alsace region in France. These cookies could be found during religious holidays and at pilgrimage sites, as these cookies usually depicted biblical scenes which were used as an educational tool for the illiterate. These cookies are typically known for being licorice flavored because of the anise seeds. Depending on which modern recipe you go with, I have seen, in fact, I baked some, I will include a link to it with a step-by-step -step tutorial on my beginner cookies. But for those cookies, you put anise seeds on the cookie tray and then once you've cut out your dough, you lay the cookies on top of the anise seeds and bake them that way. I have also seen modern recipes where they call for anise seed oil 
or you can take your anise seeds and roast them before putting your cookies on the cookie tray or taking the anise seeds and crushing them up with a mortar and pestle and crush up the anise seeds and then put those crushed anise seeds in the cookie dough. So with modern recipes, do what you want to do. If I mispronounced this one, I'm sorry, speculus cookies also date back to the 17th century and they were from the Netherlands, but could also be found in parts of Belgium, France, and Germany. These spice cookies include cinnamon, nutmeg, and clove were made for the celebration of St. Nicholas Day, which is on December 6th. Lebkuchen is German gingerbread. There's also Pfefferkuchen, which is, I think German um, gingerbread, but with peppers rather than ginger and French gingerbread. So to recap, we have cookies made with either anise seed or cinnamon, nutmeg, and clove, or ginger, or pepper, just depending on the different spices. One interesting thing to note though, um, with the Netherlands, I think part of the reason why these cookies became popular with having cinnamon, nutmeg, and clove is due to the trade route with the, the Dutch East India Company. Mold materials. Most historical materials you'll find were used were either fired clay, metal. I've seen references saying that stone was used. However, looking at museums and such, I have not found any examples of stone molds that still exist and wood. Wood was the most popular by the 17th century, especially starting about the 16th to the 17th century when the wood carvers really began to blossom. Then that's when these woods were typically, or the molds were typically made from woods from regular farm trees, which could be apple, pear, cherry, lime, linden, and elm. The main thing is you wanted a wood where, how to describe this? You want a wood where it's not very porous and it makes the surface very easy to clean and be able to reuse again. Here is one historical recipe that I have found. It is the earliest recipe that I found for Springerle cookies um, and it's from 1688. As you can see on the left hand side is a copy of the actual German recipe. On the right hand side is the hand well, on the right hand side is the written version of what is on the left. So if you notice some of the words, like for example, the first word, it says N-J-M-M-E. Well, that's what looks like with the calligraphy on the left. So that's what was written on the right, but obviously that's not a word. N-J-M-M-E is not a word. That J is actually an I and it's N-I-M-M. Other words, if you look, look like they either, it looks like an F, but it's really an S, or you might see a V. A V could be a U. Some words are spelled one way and are spelled differently now. For example, if you look on the right-hand side, the second line up from the bottom, the first word, it looks like it says the English word of wider. It's wieder. And it's actually the modern spelling in German is W-I-E-D-E-R. So it took some, took a little bit trying to figure out what words were actually meant to be written here or trying to do the modern translation of it. And so here on the left-hand side, I have done my translation of the recipe from um, the last page. So you look, left hand side is the German from 1688. On the right is the literal translation of that, of that writing. And then here is my translation. Springle cookies were, um, the actual translation is to make jumpers, but these cookies were known as jumping horse. And some of the things in this recipe 
did not make sense at first, so I had to do some more research. For example, if you look on the first line of the recipe, it says take a pound of sugar, poke it and see it. But then it says take 24 loth flour. I looked at my um, German English translating dictionary. I looked online. I did research trying to figure out what a loth is. Come to find out, a loth is also known as a lot, L O T, which was a unit of mass used in Germany, Austria, and Scandinavia. It was replaced by the German Reich in the mid to late 1800s, between 1868 to 1877. Each country, Germany first, and then Austria, and then Scandinavia, they varied in what year they switched from the lot to the Reich. And I think this was a good decision because by the way it looks, the lot, this unit of mass, was not a definitive unit of mass because it is 1 32nd of a pound. However, depending on the year and what you are using, that pound could fluctuate, which is why I have written that it's approximately 14 to 18 grams for one lot. So back to the original recipe where it says to take 24 lots, I figured out taking 18 grams for one and then taking 18 times 24, and then that's where you get on the right hand side uh, my interpretation, which shows 432 grams or close to one pound. It's 0.95 pounds. So for this recipe, it looks like they want just a little bit more sugar and a little less flour, which looking at modern recipes for this cookie, I find interesting because either you find the same amount of sugar and flour or you might find a little more flour and less sugar, like say two cups of sugar and three cups of flour. Other recipes will say two cups sugar, two cups flour. This one specifically says a little more sugar and a little less flour. One thing with this recipe, if I go back here to the original German, if you look near the bottom, there are two references. Actually, I Let's see, actually it's in the middle. There are two references where it says limo, L-E. On the one line, it's right in the middle. It says and L-E, and then it looks like it's either a little S or a dash, and then it looks like monichest. Moni we'll go with that pronunciation. If I've mispronounced that, please let me know. But, as much research as I did, I could not find a translation for limo. The rest of the word is either, depending on which one you're looking at, it's either peels or juice, but there are no references to the limo. I found one recipe that had interpreted this original recipe, but in that recipe, they person who had done the interpretation put lemon, but the German word for lemon is Zitron with a Z, Z-I-T-R-O-N, which to me does not look anything like L-E-M-O. It's not like the one German word that I pointed out earlier of Wieder, where the modern translation or the modern word has an E in it, where in 1688 the E was omitted. To me, Limo, the closest that I could find that made sense for this would be a lime. A lime in German is a limit. Looking at modern recipes, I have found some recipes that call for lemon peels or lemon juice. Well, in my opinion, there isn't too much difference between lemons and limes. They're both part of the citrus family. So for this, I went with a limo being a lime. We'll see if it works. Also in this recipe, there was the word I, E-I. The literal translation for this is egg. But where they, where egg fell in this recipe did not make sense. Springerle cookies for modern recipes call for eggs, but they're part of the dough before it gets baked. This recipe from 1688 says to either it says after you've made your dough, you've 
rolled out your cookies over the mold, you baked your cookies to um, bake them, roll brown, and then bring them out of the oven, let them cool, and then it says sweep over with one eye. So it could be sweep over with one egg, as in maybe an egg wash, and then put it back, the cookie back in the pans, and then maybe bake it again because there are breads during this time period that are baked twice, cookies that were baked twice. So maybe that's where you bake your cookie, maybe put an egg wash over it. And so the I, the egg is correct. And then you bake it a second time with that egg wash on it the second time. Or maybe ice, the EI, maybe it's supposed to be icing. Maybe it's supposed to be ice. Because, again, one of the things that's not written in the 1688 recipe that I found with modern recipes for Springer Lake cookies is that after you've molded your cookie and you've set it on the cookie, on your cookie sheet, you want to let it sit for at least 24 up to 48 hours before baking. You want to let it dry out. That way it keeps the form of the cookie. If you for example, on my little cookie roll here, these impressions will be on your cookie. If you bake your cookie when it's still fresh dough, all of these impressions will start to bake away. So you want to let your cookie sit for 24 to 48 hours, which is another thing with this recipe from 1688. It says to let your cookie stand for a short hour. I would recommend at least 24 hours, not just one hour because you want your cookie to dry. But after that 24 hour period and you've let your cookies dry, you wanna take like a, for example, a wet washcloth and just moisten the bottom of the cookies and then put them on top of the anise seeds on the cookie tray before you bake them. This will help make the bottoms more even on the bottom before you bake them because the cookies have laid out, they're dry, but it just it works better having them moistened. That's why if in this recipe it says sweep over with one if if the EI was meant to be ice, which the German word for ice is EISS, that would make sense rather than taking a wet washcloth. You could just rub over the bottoms with one ice and then put it back on the cookie tray and then back in the oven to bake a second time. Another thing with this recipe was one word that I had trouble with translating and closest translation I can come to with this is the word unclear. But with baking, I don't know what exactly an unclear would be. The closest thing I could think of would be egg whites because again, looking at modern recipes for this type of cookie, you want eggs. The, for the beginner Springer Lake cookies that I bake, I believe the recipe calls for five eggs. If you look at the recipe from 1688, it calls for a pound of sugar, almost a pound of flour. You want cinnamon clove, nutmeg, and then the lime peels, and then it says do with unclear. So this is my interpretation of this recipe. The thing that I found interesting with this specific recipe is that it calls for cinnamon, clove, and nutmeg. And these are actually spices that you normally don't find in Springer Lake cookies. They are spices that you find. It's reminiscent of the speculus recipe. If you want more information on other historical Springer Lake recipes, here is one on the left from 1824, that's the German and then the English translation on the right. This recipe can be found in a basil cookbook. And onto another type of molded holiday cookie. This is a recipe of to make gingerbread of almonds. And this recipe is in Lady Barbara Fleming's gingerbreads um, recipe from 1673. On the left hand side, you can actually see her handwritten recipe. And on the right hand side is the translation of the writing on the left. And just for fun, there's also a couple of examples of molds down at the bottom. 
Here's some other historic gingerbread recipes. Uh, this is one on the left and one on the right. And I believe these are both from, I want to say the 18th or maybe the 19th century. I have more information at the very end of the at the very end of this discussion with website links for you to find more information if you have questions about these recipes. So on to molds. This is an example of an English mold. It's lit, late medieval, early Tudor. It's from about the mid 15th into the early 16th century. It's on display at the Museum of London. It's made from terracotta. It's a carved figure of St. Catherine. And this, it says, was probably used on the Saint's Feast Day, which is November 25th, for the mass production of almond breads or biscuit breads. St. Catherine was one of the most popular saints in the medieval period, and there were many chapels, chantries, and churches ded dedicated to her memory in London. And I also have the dimensions here if you're interested in maybe trying to make your own mold. But when you look for molds, you will find a lot of them, at least in museums, a lot of them are German-based. That was the only English mold that I could find. There may be more out there. I was trying to look through as many museum websites as I could. But again, most of the ones I found were either German or maybe from Belgium, somewhere mainland Europe, not specifically England. That was the only English one. Here is one. This one is a model depicting the Annunciation to Mary in Hortus. It says in Hortus Inclusus, which is a suppressed garden. And the Archangel Michael as the hunter of a unicorn who seeks refuge in the lap of a virgin. It's from about the mid 15th century from the Middle Rhine territory. It's cast in tin, um, well, pewter. Pewter is about 90% tin. And here are the dimensions. And this is at the Germanisches National Museum. On the left hand side is the mold the side where you would put the dough in. So I guess that would be the negative side. And then the smaller picture is the positive side. So that gives you an idea of what the cookie would look like once it came out of the mold. Here is another mold. This one is a model depicting the Last Judgment. In the upper part of the circle sprinkled with foliage, stars, and flowers, Christ is enthroned with raised hands, his feet on the globe, trumpet blowing angels float next to his head, and is surrounded by the cross nimbus. Below is the depiction of the res resurrection of the dead. On the left, on the left, the blessed go to heaven, on the right, the damned go to hell. This is also at the Germanisches National Museum. This specific mold is from about 1470 to 1480. It's also from the Central Rhine territory. It's made of fired clay and there are the dimensions on the bottom left side. And here is another mold. And just for the purposes of today's discussion, if I say model or modal mold, I'm talking about these the cookie molds. It's all the same thing. For this one, this one is from around 1500. It's the coat of arms in the tower with a lady with a falcon holding a shield. And then it is made of wood and the dimensions, it's about 1.8 centimeters. I guess that would be 1.8 centimeters in depth and with a diameter of 11 centimeters. And on the left hand side is the negative, and on the right hand side, or I guess on the left hand side, the picture is the negative. That would be the side where you would put the cookie dough in and push it in. The picture in the middle, that is actually the 
other side of this mold so you don't see what the positive side looks like. And here is another mold. This one is a shield holder with an Alliance coat of arms. It's from about 1541 and it's a about uh, 13.7 centimeters in diameter. And this is also made of wood. This is at the Swiss, Swiss National Museum. Here is another one at the Swiss National Museum. This is, on one side it's a fish and on the other side is a rice creeper. This one I found to be interesting because most molds you will find it's only got one side. I found this mold to be interesting because most molds you will find only have one side where you will have a negative on one side and you may or may not see the positive of that same picture on the other side. But this one actually has a mold, a fish on one side and the rice creeper on the other. So depending on which side of the mold you use, both sides are usable, which seems to be a bit unusual with this type of mold. This one is dated to 1542. And here's another mold. This one is from around 1600. It's um, oval shaped with a coat of arms and a leaf wreath. It's um, also at the Swiss National Museum and it's made of wood. And again, this is typical of most molds you'll find where you can see the negative and then on the other side on the right hand side that picture that's just the other side of the mold and here's another mold this one is it's a round mold with an alliance coat of arms and it's framed in a wreath it's from about 1631 and this one is also made of wood and it's also at the swiss national museum and more molds from the Swiss National Museum. If you want to find molds, various centuries, t styles, if you want clay, you want wood, I really recommend going to the Swiss National Museum website. You will not be disappointed. On the left hand side is a round mold with representation of a dance. It's from about 1650. And on the right hand side is the burned coat of arms. And that one just says it's from 1600 to 1700. And that one is made from clay that's been glazed. And more molds from the Swiss National Museum. On the left-hand side is the Alliance coat of arms from Rappenberg. And it um, also has a leaf wreath on it. It's from around 1650 and it's made of wood. On the right-hand side is if you look closely, this one's very intricate. It's St. Nicholas loading the donkey below the lion's coat of arms. And it also has branding on the back that says crowned L over W. It's from around 1675. And it's also made of wood. Here is an example of a mold where you can see both the negative on one side and the positive on the other side. This one is from Switzerland and it's actually, it's dated 1679 with the signed letters HMST. These initials refer to Hans Melchior Struden and Lohn. I mispronounced that, I'm sorry. Uh, the, both a uh, father and son of the same name ran a workshop there and for many years and in large numbers they did clay models for various pastries. However, due to the poor quality of the clay and the glaze, it's unlikely that this was an original mold made in the Strudland workshop. Instead, it's, we'll say, kind of a cheap knockoff of the original. Here is another mold. This one is from about 1690 to 1700, and it depicts a couple arguing. It's from the Eastern Switzerland region, and it's made of wood, and it's also at the Swiss National Museum. On the left-hand side, you can see the negative side, 
and on the right hand side is just the back side so you don't see the positive of the mold. This specifically is listed as being a Springerlay mold. And this one was made in Lancaster County in Pennsylvania in 1843. It's made from maple. And this one is at the muse or sorry, it's at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And this particular mold is iconic of the Springerly cookies that you will find mod in modern recipes. Because if you look, Springerly cookies, usually you can either take it and roll out your pattern, or like with this mold, you put your dough on the mold, and then once you've baked it, you or you cut out your cookies, and then you bake the cookies, but they have a rectangle shape to them. And if you'd like to know more about St. Nicholas cookie boards, then here you go. On the left-hand side are cookie boards from Germany, Switzerland, Austria, the Czech Republic, United States, and the Ukraine. In the center picture, those are all from Belgium. And on the right-hand side, those are all from the Netherlands. Since St. Nicholas goes with the holidays and molded cookies, are definitely a, a holiday type cookie, be it if it's gingerbread or Springerly, whatever type of cookie you use, you're usually using a cookie board or a mold of some sort. And it's. And so it makes sense that there are a number of cookie boards devoted to St. Nicholas. As you may have noticed, I mainly focused on molds and cookie boards. And that's because that's what a lot, of, a lot of museums have, are the molds. I found very few rolling pins that existed prior to 1900. Now that could be a lot of them were made from wood and just after wear and tear rolling pins. I could see, for example, here's a rolling pin and wear and tear after a while of rolling back and forth. Maybe handles broke off, maybe the wood eventually just started to disintegrate, who knows, and maybe that's why there aren't as many in existence today to be in museums or in private collections. But here is an example of a rolling pin. This one is from 1824. It's made from maple and hickory. And this is at the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts in Salem, North Carolina. This is a rolling pin from Bavaria. It's dated somewhere between 17 to 1800, and it's made from pear wood. And the dimensions, its length is 26 centimeters and its diameter is 7.3 centimeters. This one is found at the V&A Museum in London. After you've laid your cookie dough out flat, you've taken your rolling pin and you've rolled the impression onto the cookie dough. Then you would take a cookie cutter, cut your cookie out, and then place your cookie onto the cookie sheet for baking. Here is another rolling pin. This one is labeled as being a culinary roller. It was made in Germany and it was made in 1598. This is made from pear wood. Its diameter is 5.3 centimeters with a length of 52 centimeters, including the handles. And there's more information in the bottom right paragraph about this. One thing about this specific rolling pin is that it has an, an inscription that says, Gott allein die er, he alone is God. And it's actually inscribed 1598. That's why, or how we know exactly when this rolling pin was made. And the use of the religious inscription in German rather than in Latin shows that this was probably owned by a Protestant rather than a Catholic household. Just an interesting tidbit. And this rolling pin is at the V&A Museum. Now, if you're like me, I'm curious to know, we can find rolling pins such as this one from 1598. So we know the rolling pins existed. We know the cookie molds existed, but I like to find evidence of 
their actual use. We can find recipes in old historical recipe books, so we know that they were used. And so I went combing through different paintings, trying to find evidence besides the written recipes or the rolling pins or the cookie molds. And I didn't find much in the way of in paintings, but I did find two that had me curious. They may or may not be molded pastries. But on the left hand side is a painting by Clara Peters from about 1607. And if you look on the tray, there is, it looks like the letter shape P, like P is in Paul. And then there's one that looks like an upside down heart. Both of those have, to me, they look like cookies, but they have a texture to them, which to me is iconic of a cookie mold of some sort. And then they were able to put the mold or put the dough in the mold, let it sit, and then bake, say, the next day. And then it would have kept that shape. On the right hand side is another picture by Clara Peters. This one is from about 1611 and it's at the Museo de, del Prado. And this one, again, I could be wrong. I'm just looking at what I see. On the right hand side, you will see a silver plate. And well, first, it looks like jumbles to me. Those are the pretzel, sort of look like pretzel shapes. But then next to them, above the jumbles, you can see looks like again kind of that heart shape textured cookie. And then to the left of the silver plate is it looks like a white cookie. I'd say maybe a the capital letter D is in dog. But both the white cookie and the brown cookie both have that texture to them that to me says it was probably made from some cookie mold. If you would like to find more information, here are websites from where I found some of my information. And here are more websites. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Post them in the comments below. Remember to select like if you like this video and click subscribe.